You talked about kids getting diagnosed with things like ADHD, and uh, this brought to mind for me the number of kids that get diagnosed with autism. Um, I'm in my 40s. I now have a bunch of friends that have young kids, and several of them have, have said, oh, my, my children have autism. I don't, like, this seems like a simplistic question, but I don't remember this many children having autism when I was growing up. Is this a matter of autism is actually increasing or what we're diagnosing is is um, more autism. And the reason I ask you is because I think you have an interesting insight into the, the minds of people. And I think most people don't even really have a concept for what autism is. If somebody were to say your child has autism, they really don't know what that means other than they, you know, they, they really need things to be patterned or something. Yeah, also found that when I looked at um, children uh, my own children and children of friends and that uh, the diagnostic uh, criteria that they're being subjected to, they're not always that helpful. It's more interesting to uh, think what's particular going on with this particular child than to see where the uh, DSM category fits. And uh, this determines the treatment. The, uh, with respect to your question, I think both happen. So we have more diagnostic criteria when I was um, young then autism or Asperger's was just discovered as a um, possible diagnosis and ADHD uh, also was not something that was frequently diagnosed. It was just something with, that was not so much on the radar. Autism did exist, but it was mostly applied to more severe cases. But uh, the more severe cases have also increased. So it's not just that autism gets more um, diagnosed more readily, but uh, children with learning disabilities, with difficulty to focus, with more increased uh, sp uh, spells of dissociation, this difficulty to develop intuitive empathy and so on, this seems to be on the rise. And the severe cases uh, of autism, so uh, not Asperger's, uh, but people who are uh, unable to learn to speak, that uh, cannot walk properly, that cannot control their emotions at all, and might be uh, clawing at other people or biting them or themselves, and hurt themselves in the process. And so that is severely dysfunctional. This is also increased. And I think that autism, first of all, is a developmental defect. It means that your nervous system is not forming in the right way. And developmental defects are uh, caused either by genetics, which means that uh, there is some problem in your genetic code that is not being um, beat it out, it's just genetic drift, mutations that accumulate randomly over generations in which you, uh, child mortality is decreasing, which means you know no longer selecting for defects. And the other thing is that uh, environmental influences can interact with your development. And uh, we don't in the US have a strong precautionary principle for uh, chemicals. Basically, if something doesn't kill the rats in three months, it's fine. And uh, unless you find a good reason to believe that it's not. And if there is something that is by itself not toxic, but it's just disrupting signaling processes during development, uh, very uh, subtle um, chemical signals that tell cells in your brain uh, what type of cell there should be and what mode there should be in depending on the proximity to certain other points in the brain that secrete certain chemicals and interact with them. And these individual cells are locally measuring this chemical gradient. This is how the different cells know where they are in the brain and what kind of cell they should differentiate on, right? And uh, these effects are, if they interact with chemicals, for instance, in your foot or in your water or in uh, your clothing or in your furniture, um, then uh, it's very difficult to detect these effects in a rat experiment because they are uh, going to be different for every species. And uh, in humans, they play out a very long time. You basically need to look uh, over an entire generation on how the effect will be before you know with certainty. And this is something that is very deeply concerning to me. So if we have, uh, in uh, after we change the chemical composition of our foot and allow a number of new chemicals in our foot within a single generation. And uh, within that generation, we see a lot of increase of developmental defects. I'm very concerned, especially since we don't have any coordination to get rid of that. That I am, uh... I'm really glad I asked you this because I'm very surprised by that. You're one of the only people in the scientific community I've ever met that said, hey, I think it could be something in our food or the, the clothing that we're wearing could be doused with some kind of chemical. It's, 
this has to be something that I mean, in in the world that I live in, um, not many scientific people think this way. It would put you pretty far outside of that little um, you know enclave. Oh, I don't think so. I suspect that um, most people that I'm talking to will uh, be aware of the fact that, for instance, estrogen in the drinking water since we introduced the pill is an issue. Uh, right, the estrogen that are, are being is being used as a contraceptive and that is not completely filtered out in water treatment is uh, visibly affecting fish and uh, and, and animals in, in the environment. So we see this effect. And uh, it's probably also affecting people. Right? If you give everybody estrogen, even if it's a low dose estrogen uh, during their development in utero and as babies and as children, it's going to have a slight effect on their bodies. And uh, the same is true for um, substances in our food and uh, food chain that are mimicking hormones, that is messaging, messaging chemical chemicals. For instance, um, phthalates uh, have the property that they can um, interact with some of the receptors that are being used by hormones in our own body. And as a result, give a signaling to how our bodies should develop. And the same is also uh, true for um, um, not just phthalates, but um, probably also for soy. So a lot of soy products that got into our food chain uh, might interact at uh, some subtle level uh, with our signaling. And so if this were, if this, uh, what, what does a human do, right? That if it's in your food or in your water, I can remember living in, uh, in Africa and there was a time when we thought aflatoxin was in the corn and like corn was everything you ate, right? It was like the primary, um, you get ate a paste called ugali. And when you start to have a fear that something is poisonous in the food, even in low doses, it uh, clouds your every thought. Like basically everything you're thinking and doing all day, every day, swirls around the idea that you may be being poisoned. So if if this is what you're thinking about, is, does this cloud all of your thoughts or was I being hyperbolic no, when I was living in No, not Africa? at all. I'm not trying to think about it that much. I'm trying to uh, mostly eat the things that I think my ancestors ate. I suspect that people can, within a few generations, uh, get, uh, be fine with most food sources, also with a lot of toxins in food, because we can just evolve to deal with these toxins. But it will be at the expense of child mortality, right? Because the only way that something gets into the next generation is that uh, it mutates into the next generation. Most mutations are not in the right direction. So uh, throughout human history, there has been a selection uh, for new traits. The reason why we have new generations is adaptation because the individual organism cannot adapt very much. The individual organism can converge to something that has already been built into it by evolution. So there's a certain range of things that you can adapt to, but it can uh, usually not adapt to completely new food sources very well. And uh, if you uh, want to have something that is non-deleterious, you need to stay with this for a few generations and allow mutation and selection. And of course, we all agree, we don't want to have selection. We don't want to die um, in childhood or we don't want our children to die. So how can, can we achieve that? I don't really know a solution to this. We can do a few things with pre-implantation diagnostics. So we can filter out deleterious mutations that we already know that they're not good ones. But it's difficult to use uh, something like pre-implantation diagnostics to select for benevolent mutations because we don't know how they will play out. So it's very difficult for us to breed a new generation that is able to deal with new food sources. And so my tendency would be to be, for myself, relatively conservative with food. I would want to eat similar food as works for my ancestors. And if I try new food, I would want to monitor how I feel it interacts with my own body. On at scale, there is very little we can do because uh, we have certain food that is very cheap to produce at any given time. If enormous amount of people, we probably cannot change agricultural food production back to the state that it was in 100 years ago and still feed, feed people comfortably. So we have to deal with the fact somehow that our food is now different. You know, when we were talking before about autism and Asperger's and you talk about mutations or the, like this is a like a mental defect, the several friends that I have that have Asperger's, it is it's made them extraordinary in some ways. Like certainly they're a little bit difficult to get along with sometimes or they have some quirks, but 
But that trait uh, combined with high IQ has made them capable of doing things or paying attention to things that most normies couldn't even come close to. Yes, but I suspect that the majority of people on the spectrum do not develop superpowers. Uh, so on average, I suspect the, they are less employable. And the people that you become aware of, uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, they are the outliers. Right, so there is a selection bias. You will uh, have among your friends mostly those that are super functional, that have local superpowers, typically at the expense of something else. And um, I think when you have um, high functioning autism, Asperger's, and, and you have difficulty to make models that are very deep, which is often the case. So it, one of the problems that uh, I seem to be seeing often in people that uh, are on the autism spectrum is that they have, there seems to be an issue with signal propagation, which means that the signals in their brain do not go very deeply over too many layers. It's as if they are operating on a higher frequency, so their loops are shorter. And as a result, they need to integrate over fewer layers. And as a compensation, their brain will increase the degree to which they can discover patterns on the previous layer. So these people are often down in the weeds. They might not see the big picture very easily, but they're very, very good at dealing with the small picture. And computers are all about the small picture. Computers are a catnip for many people with Asperger's because the world of the computer is essentially flat. It's not deep. Everything is scripted. Everything is conceptual. It's all on the same level. It's the opposite of art. For art, you need to look very deep. Right? You make this connection between what's meaningful to you and what you perceive on the lowest level, and you go very, very deeply. You see the significance of things. And there are also uh, people which are very deep into art often sinister states and so on, are probably also on the spectrum, just in the other direction. Right? So when we think of autism, we mostly think of people that are uh, very literal, that uh, have sensory overflow issues, uh, uh, because they have uh, difficulty to uh, single out uh, stable features from the layers that they are observing. And stability requires that you uh, integrate over many layers. And you have, on the other hand, people that are uh, are in the permanently holy mode that uh, see everything as extremely significant, even the smallest dust mode in the sky, and uh, that are uh, also not getting anything done for different reasons, right? And th this is, might be part of the same spectrum in a way, that, where the speed or the, or, the, or the depth of signal transmission in the perceptual system is affected. And I suspect that for uh, ADHD, a similar thing happens, not for perceptual signals, but it happens for control signals. So uh, people with ADHD tend to be very impulsive, which means they uh, have difficulty to interact on the uh, on long games, on long game reward. They often can think long-term, but they are often not able to act on the long-term impulses because the short-term impulses take over. It's basically as if there's a hierarchy of functions, of purposes that determines your behavior and only the purposes that give immediate reward can affect the behavior, whereas uh, the purposes that affect the long game cannot become effective, which leads to enormous frustration for these individuals because they know better at some level. They just don't find that they act on their understanding of the world. Ah, ah, ah.